All right, um, it's my pleasure to introduce my um, colleague, Mike Bober. Um, Mike is uh, known to a lot of people around here because he did his um, train, uh, some of his training at least at Tulane University. He was um, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering there. He actually, he has a degree in biomedical engineering and also an MD from Tulane. Um, he has um, developed an expertise in skeletal dysplasias that very few people have. He's currently the Associate Professor of uh, Pediatrics at uh, Jefferson Medical School. He's employed by Nemours um, Children's Clinic and DuPont Children's Hospital, which is the institution I work for. And he has, um, he with um, Will McKenzie has developed a skeletal dysplasia uh, program there that is um, second to none, I think. And uh, he's now the co-director of that uh, skeletal dysplasia program. So um, without any further introduction, I'm going to turn it over to him because he has a lot to talk to us about. Mike? All right. Well, thanks, Pam. Thanks, everyone, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk and tell you something about um, the topic that I'm it really excites me, and I hope in 8 o'clock Saturday morning I can, I can at least generate nobody falling asleep. That's the goal. Um, so the <coughs> task I was given was to sort of give an overview of skeletal dysplasias, but also talk about some emerging therapies. And I think any of these four topics could, could easily get an hour. <laughs> so I'm going to move fast and just try and cover some highlights. Uh, and as a way of disclosure, uh, I was the site uh, principal investigator for Morchio and hypophosphatasia trial. So skeletal dysplasias are the abnormalities of growth development and maintenance of bone and cartilage. And here you can see a panel of pictures with a couple different patients illustrating the different forms and the different kinds of dysplasias. Just briefly, you can see short trunks, long trunks, bowed legs, knock knees, all kinds of, of differences and different deformities. Each of these dysplasias uh, you know, have unique causes and really need unique treatment. If you look at any individual dysplasia, they're relatively rare. But when you add them up together, including the ones that we see and, and babies that are lost prenatally, you get a pretty high number. You get a number here that's basically five in 10,000, which sits somewhere around the level of CF. So when a kid comes to the clinic, you know, sort of at first glance, what, what's a general approach that you want to have? And, and I usually go out to the waiting room and actually walk the patient into the room. And by the time I get them into the room, I've seen how they walk, I looked at their proportions, I have a general idea how tall they are, and I have a pretty good idea about what might be going on before I ever say hello or ever do an exam. But you want to look at their size. You want to say, do they have short limbs? Do they have a short trunk? Is there craniofacial involvement? Does it look like there's a flat midface? Is there a history of a cleft? Do you see hearing aids? Other medical issues, sometimes this can be the clue. There's many skeletal dysplasias, or at least several, that have immune deficiency or have renal failure associated with them, that these might be clues diagnostically. And of course, you want to review your x-rays. Now, I'm a big believer in reviewing your own x-rays and not trusting anybody else. Um, but this can be problematic because there's nobody to teach you, and you're just going to have to jump in that pool but what you're not really going to make a diagnosis from an x-ray. Uh, an x-ray is going to help you get in sort of the ballpark of the disorder that your patient has. You're looking for global changes. You don't need to look at the left hip and sort of make a diagnosis. You want to look, for example, at epiphyses. If this is a normal epiphysis, are the epiphyses small? Or are they irregular? And if they are, they're going to be that way at every single joint. At the metaphysis, does it appear widened? Is it irregular? Is the growth plate thickened? 
you're looking for global patterns. <clears throat> looking at the spine, are their vertebral bodies shorter? Do they have end plate irregularities? And then it kind of goes to alphabet soup. If epiphyseal dysplasia is E and metaphyseal dysplasia is M and spondylodysplasia is S, you sort of get these, these five basic groups. So the x-ray can get you into that group, and then you put together these other things that can often help you arrive often at a precise diagnosis, not all the time. So when you're looking at an individual, you also want to pay attention to disproportion, and this is disproportion inside of the limb. So if this is a typical arm here, you can have proximal shortening here up the, at the shoulder. This is rhizomelic shortening. You can have shortening in the middle segment, mesomelic shortening. Shortening at the distal end, at the hand, acromelic shortening. Shortening can be across all three domains, which is micromelic shortening. Or there can be some bowing, which is uh, campomelia. So I always joke, I took over this position from Charles Scott, uh, and, and Charles was a really an important player in dysplasias and actually helped to name many of them and helped to classify them. But when he started, he had it so easy because there were two diagnoses. If you had short limbs, you were an acon. And if you had a short trunk, you were morchio. And that was it. I got about 450 diagnoses to sort through. Now, I have better technology than he does, did too, but um, this is the point. So how can you help to organize these things? Well, people are doing that for us. There is this international nosology group that you can see over the last uh, many years have been organizing and classifying these conditions. Uh, the last um, revision was in 2010. There were 456 dysplasias or conditions listed in this. They're divided into 40 major groups as defined by either molecular, biochemical, or radiographic criteria. 316 at that time, so a significant fraction, we knew what the gene was. And interestingly, there were only 226 genes. So a lot of genes cause uh, different and distinct phenotypes. This is your list of 40. You have two seconds. Okay. Now, um, these three groups, I don't know if this is showing up too well, but these three groups, the FGFR3 group, the abnormal bone mineralization group, and the lysosomal storage disease, dysostosis multiplex group, these are the three groups that there are new and emerging treatments, and these are the ones that I'm going to focus e each one of them. Uh, the rest of the talk on telling you about what the things are going on. There are treatments for some of the other groups as well, but these are the things that are newer. Okay, so we're going to start with Morkio. So I, the way I arranged this is I, I figured I would pick the one that was closest to the pharmacy. So I think the one <coughs> for Morkio is furthest along. And uh, if you're like me, sometimes the history of these disorders is kind of fun. So. 1929, Dr. Morchio and Dr. Brailsford, Morchio, a uh, pediatrician who was split his time a little bit between Uruguay and France, wrote in French this paper. And Brailsford, who was a, actually a radiologist in training uh, in Birmingham, England, wrote this paper. People loved Dr. Morchio. He was just this charismatic, lovely man Dr. Brailsford was a bit more bristly. So over time, Morchio Brailsford um, just became Morchio. 1965, flash forward. Here's Dr. McCusick's paper where he classified the mucopolysaccharidoses, and this is where MPS4 came in. The, and the name MPS4 came in from Dr. McCusick. 
and the hallmark was that these were kids that had skeletal features, corneal clouding, and keratin sulfate in their urine. That was the uh, compound they were excreting. Ten years later, basically, the gallon S enzyme was identified as the cause, uh, the enzyme deficiency for that keratin sulfate excretion, and uh, this was Morchio syndrome. But as the test became available, it was clear that there was a second group of patients who also had keratin sulfate in their urine, also had a similar skeletal dysplasia, but did not share the same enzyme deficiency. And a couple years later, uh, there was Morchio B, and uh, beta-galactosidase was the second enzyme. What they have in common is that they are the first two steps in the degradation pathway of keratin sulfate. Here's the gallon S acting up here, and then the second cleavage step is the beta-galactosidase. And what ends up happening is this keratin sulfate accumulates in the growth plates, in the soft tissues, and that leads to the phenotype of Morchio syndrome. There's a wide range of incidents. Um, safe to say it's probably at least one in 100,000. Features are that this, there's a short trunk dwarfism. You can see this young man's hands basically come down to touch his knee. There's significant spinal involvement with odontoid hypoplasia, kyphoscoliosis. Often there's a pectus carinatum, increased AP diameter. You can see the genu valgum or knock knee, and there's also coxa valga in the hip. Radiographic changes can be present before clinical signs actually present. And you can see by this young man, really, really lax joints. Extraskeletally, this keratin sulfate accumulates not everywhere, but certainly not the brain, which is the, a big difference from the other MPSs, but it's in the airway and lungs, it's in the heart valves, it's in the middle ear tissues, the liver, the cornea, the soft tissues of the face, and somehow uh, it really plays a significant role in the dental enamel, which is quite poor, and these, these patients have very bad teeth. This is a, the key feature, skeletally, is this is uh, skull base C1, C2. The odontoid of C2 here is underdeveloped. It does not come up all the way into the ring of C1. In addition, there's marked ligamentous laxity like I showed you in that hand. So what often can happen is there's uh, subluxation of C1 on C2, cervical instability. That, and there's extra dural storage of this keratin sulfate. So between the dura and the bone, this stuff stores. So you have a spinal canal that's narrow from instability and then further narrowed by the storage. And this can lead uh, to cervical myelopathy and even death. So this is a, a very important medical problem. History-wise, these kids typically appear healthy at birth. Uh, you probably can, well not probably, you can see radiographically if you look at an infant, um, signs of early signs of dysostosis multiplex. But typically 18 months old is about when they present, certainly most by the age of three. Patients with the severe phenotype usually die in their second or third decade of life, either related to the cervical instability or pulmonary disease. Milder patients, this is an enzyme deficiency, so there's a spectrum. Milder patients uh, can live longer. So this is the updated chart from Victor McCusick. There's more forms of MPS. They're a little better organized. And here you can see the enzyme replacements um, it's approved for Hunter, uh, I'm sorry, Hurler approved for Hunter. Um, both of these approvals and the one down here for Maritola May, um, one of the key factors in having the drug approved was a six minute walk test which improved. So what I'm gonna tell you about is uh, Morchio A, a gallon S replacement which is in phase three trials now where one of the primary endpoints is also the six minute walk test. So Biomarin developed this, um, basically a synthetic gallon S enzyme. Uh, 
I was working yesterday on, I don't know if the Bimarin people are here or not, but I, you know, I've been calling it BMN 110 forever. But when they apparently, when they submitted to the FDA, they gave it a real name. I don't know where people come up with this stuff. I'm not even sure how to say it, but they're gonna call this uh, Vimizizim, I think. Or at least that's how you spell it. Um, but the key pivotal trial here for this is, is with m more four. Uh, it's a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial where there were three arms. There's a placebo group, there was a two milligram per kilo uh, weekly group, and a two milligram per kilo every other week. This trial lasted for six months, 24 weeks, and then there was an extension trial. Now, the, in the extension trial, nobody was getting placebo. The, the patients were either randomized into then every other week or every week. So these are like the other enzyme replacements for these disorders. This is a four or five hour IV infusion every week or other week. Um, <coughs> like I just said, 24 weeks in duration. The primary endpoint was the six minute walk test. Secondary endpoints included three minute stair climb, various pulmonary function tests, and keratin sulfate levels. I don't want to get too bogged down in all this data, um, but at 24 weeks, there was a statistically significant improvement in the six minute walk test. Compared to baseline, um, in general, people were walking about 22 meters better than they were before they started. The stair climb did not reach statistical significance. Maybe they walked one stair better. Now, keep in mind these are quite, let's just say, orthopedically challenged people with their hip and their knee issues. So some of the rate limiting step in going up and down stairs might have to do with orthopedic difficulties rather than pulmonary difficulties. The keratin sulfate was pretty dramatic. So there's a 40% decrease in the amount of keratin sulfate in the urine, uh, very statistically significant and seen across the board. Now let me just go back one second and say, so this was the more four. Now the extension study, not everybody in uh, 004 is actu actually, now they're all finished. But at the time when this data was made, um, not everybody was 36 or 48 weeks in. But what you can see is this walk test. Here's 12 weeks, 23, 24 weeks, 36, 36 weeks, up to 46. So there, there seemed like there was some continued improvement as the people kept going. And then as a pulmonary function test, um, one of the parameters that they measured is, is the maximum voluntary ventilation. So basically what they asked you to do is breathe in and out as deeply and as quickly as you can for 15 seconds and they, they figure out in liters how much air you moved, multiply that by four for a minute, and then you get a number. Uh, so you can see that there was a, t a 10 liter increase in the amount of air that was moved in a minute. Uh, whoops, not quite um, reaching statistical significance. I don't know if you can see, but that's 0.09, so it's close. In terms of safety, th this drug behaves just like all the other. If you're familiar with the hunters and the hurlers, it behaves the same way. Um, about 25% of the people that got the drug had some kind of adverse event, most commonly vomiting, pyrexia, headache, nausea, cough. In terms of serious events, there, there were, three per, interestingly, 3.4 in the weekly group, 1.7% in the other, uh, every other week group, and none in the placebo group. Nobody died, nobody withdrew from the study. The infusion reactions themselves were 1.3%, so 17 reactions out of 1,345 infusions. Um, these things seem pretty typical and easy to manage with rate adjustments and uh, different kinds of pre-medications. So I wanna play this, so this is um, my patient who's on the study. Uh, she, uh, I saw her on Wednesday. She actually this week had her 48-week visits. Uh, she's had a 
fairly dramatic response. And um, when I told her I was coming and I was going to tell people about this, she said, wait, 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 you have to let me say something. I said, all right. So we shot this. This is quick, but let's take a listen to what she thinks about her experience. So I think the take home, you know, Sarah's done really well, and uh, the last she's been about 18 months on the drug, and over the last maybe six weeks or two months, what's been remarkable uh, is she's actually been walking into the hospital. So for six, to, who knows, ten years she's been in a wheelchair for distance. So if she's in a parking lot. She's taking the wheelchair into the hospital, rolling it through the hospital to get to uh, the infusion center. Uh, that's changed in the last six, six weeks or so. She's actually started walking from the parking lot, and, and that tells you about how she's feeling. She has a little bit more aches and pains than she used to, but at least for now we're attributing that more to the increased activity than something else. 16. So she's done growing, and this is, this is, I guess, a good segue to my next point. Well, uh, let me, one other thing. So Biomarin uh, submitted the license application for this, and basically they expect to hear from the FDA uh, by the end of February <coughs> 2014. Now, my understanding is the FDA could approve this or ask for more information, but it is close to the end game for, for this drug. I think it's really clear at least to me, that this, and watching Sarah, we used to call Sarah Darth Vader because when she would walk in the room, her tongue would be on her upper lip, and that's how she was breathing. Her sister couldn't sleep with her because she was such a snorer, loud breather, but her sister's sleeping with her now. Her tongue's in her mouth. We don't hear that. There's a lot of, um, her PFT's improved almost 200% thus far. So I think it's really clear this works on the soft tissue, much like everything else. What we don't know is what it does to the skeleton. And I would just caution everybody that's still involved with these people not to lose track of the upper cervical spine and not to lose track of the neck. And really, at some point, we need to take images of, of these people, not MRIs, not just in, in neutral like this, because this looks beautiful in neutral. But look what happens when this child flexes and their chin goes down to chest, there's an awful degree of cord compression that's completely missed if you just take your MRIs in neutral. This is a, an area, taking MRIs in flexion and extension that can be problematic in different centers. Um, it can, we often have to bring kids to our center to get this done. Uh, and I'm not gonna spend time on this, but we did just publish um, flexion extension cervical MR this is safe, and it is effective, and there's all, all the examples that you need to see are here. So I would really um, urge you, if you're going to image your patient and you want to pay attention to the upper cervical spine, to get the MRIs both in flexion and extension, and of course neutral as well. Right, so that's the, quick, that's the quick and dirty for Morchio. So moving on to hypophosphatasia. Okay. While, um, until the FDA makes up their mind? Yeah, I took that slide out, but there, so right now all the patients are in this uh, 005 study, which is an extension study of 004, and that will stay active until it's approved. There are also some other ongoing trials. There are trials. I think that are still enrolling for kids under five. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And I think there are some, there are other opportunities if people want to get on it now, but I think they're going to keep going. 
Um, so hypophosphatasia, really this was, this was another disorder, at least in the severe forms, where there was not much to do, and it kind of was a horse hospital, horse medicine practice here. I don't know if you can see this uh, cartoon too well. But hypophosphatasia is a disorder that's really characterized by poor skeletal and dental mineralization. It's caused by loss of functions in the tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase gene, that's TNSALP. And that's a gene on chromosome one that uh, has about 525 amino acids. The disease severity is inversely related to the age of uh, presentation. So the most severe kids present in utero, perinatal form. Um, perinatal is invariably a lethal disorder. Infantile, kids that present in the first year or so of life, there's about a 50% mortality rate. Um, there are then juvenile forms, there are adult forms, there are forms that just affect the teeth. For the most part, they're recessive. Uh, but some of the severe mutations in a dominant manner can cause teeth problems in adults or mild bone problems in adults. So there, there's multiple forms of inheritance, albeit all from the same TNSALP gene. Uh, biochemically, the alkaline phosphatase levels are very low, at least in the severe form in infancy. Calcium levels are elevated. <laughs> phosphate levels can be elevated. And the substrates for TNS, uh, um, ALP, the substrates for alkaline phosphatase are also elevated. So you're talking about inorganic pyrophosphate, which is a mineralization inhibitor, um, pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is often measured as pyridoxal 6-phosphate or B6, and phosphoethanolamine, which can be measured in the urine through a urine amino acid test. And there is no established medical treatment. People have tried bisphosphonates. They've tried bone marrow transplants. They've tried uh, PTH, um, an enzyme replacement even by taking um, plasma, purifying plasma, trying to pull ALP out of people's plasma and then giving that back to babies that had a very significant form. And that did nothing. So the current care is really symptomatic, so you have a lot of these kids, if they're born with this, that uh, it's really sort of a, a comfort care situation. So along comes this drug, and what's, so there, here's the, the business end of this drug, is the tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase recombinant. That's no big deal. That's pretty much a strategy that we've seen over and over again. There's an immunoglobulin domain which actually helps them purify it. But here's what's novel. What's novel is that there's a 10 aspartic acid residue sequence, 10 aspartic acids in a row, that are tagged on to the end of this. And that sequence, that motif, allows this compound to target bone. It's highly, highly affinity it has a high affinity for hydroxyapatite. So if you give this stuff to somebody, it, it basically goes right to hydroxyapatite. It binds and then does its business. So 2008, Jose Luis Milan, who's at um, La Jolla, had the knockout mouse. And here you see the knockout mouse getting the, the drug, which is now called uh, aspartase alpha. And you can see, I mean, really dramatic changes in mineralization. This was over a couple week period. So he, he had a knockout mouse that was lethal that with this drug was converted to a basically healthy mouse. So not that long after, this was the preclinical work. Uh, the company was Anobia at that time. They've subsequently been bought by Alexion. Uh, Anobia said, uh, let's do some phase two trials. Let's try it on these kids that would otherwise die. Um, this work has been published uh, March of 2012 in the New England Journal. And it's really, what I'll show you here is it's, it's unbelievably dramatic. So this was a six-month open label protocol in theory for 10 patients 
with potentially lethal hyperphosphatasia. They needed to have onset before six months, a high likelihood of mortality or morbidity, respiratory insufficiency, severe rickets, and failure to thrive. These were the kids that were going to die that we would have otherwise provided comfort care to. Uh, 11 patients were actually enrolled between October of 8 and December of 9. Um, and the reason for 11 is one dropped out, so that got them back to their 10. There were seven girls and four boys, ranging in age from two weeks to three years. Five had perinatal form and six had infantile form. All had symptoms before, two, uh, before the age of six, failure to thrive, fractures, motor delay, and some degree of respiratory compromise. 11 of 11 were hypercalcemic. Nine of 11 had nephrocalcinosis. I just remember I said the, the substrate that accumulates is the uh, pyridoxal phosphate. Those levels were somewhere between two and 18 times the upper limit of normal in these patients before they started. Um, we, we had two of the patients in this initial uh, 10. What they did was they gave an IV infusion of this drug. Um, that was primarily because they were looking for pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data. But what it really was is a subcutaneous injection, one milligram per kilo, three times a week. So a little stick, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We looked at radiographs at the midway point, 12 weeks, and then 24 weeks, the pharmacokinetics. And, uh, and then, you know, we weren't, they really weren't expecting these babies to live. They, they thought they might, the drug might have an effect. So the, the protocol was really interestingly designed because they kind of expected that the kids would continue to die. So they, they start, they, well, we'll do a little bit about biochemical, about motor development, about respiratory. What happened was unbelievable. So this was, this was my patient. This was the youngest patient. This was a child, interestingly, uh, if there are any perinatal people in the room, I'll say this story is this was a child who at, it, it, uh, you know, 18 week level two ultrasound had very poor mineralization. The <coughs> MFMs said your baby has type two OI. And they went ahead and did an amniocentesis, uh, looked at biochemically at the collagen, it was all normal, and then they came back and they said to the parents, well, it's normal, but you still have type 2 OI. So I would just caution people about a differential and hypophosphatasia. You can, I'll show you a hand x-ray in a minute. OI hands in utero have normal mineralization. OI, uh, hypophosphatasia hands do not, and, and a simple look at the hands can be really helpful in differentiating. But you can see when this baby was born at 33 weeks, and here's two weeks old, so 35 weeks corrected. The rib cage is almost non-existent. You can make a, a little streak of a bone, uh, but there's nothing here that can support respiration. The femurs, the tibia is very under-mineralized. You see these sort of, they call them tongues of radiolucency, which is a hallmark of hypophosphatasia. The bowing of these bones is indicative of fractures very poor mineralization of the vertebral bodies. 12 weeks after getting the drug, uh, this is by no means a normal skeleton, but you can see the, a dramatic change in the rib cage. These bones are thicker. They're starting to have a cortex. Uh, same here. You're starting to, to actually see the mineralization go all the way down to the growth plate and development of vertebral bodies. This is what I mean by the hands. This is at baseline, and this is now not at 12 weeks, but at 24 weeks. That's a, I mean, there's some deformity here, but that's a pretty normal looking hand. You can see what happened uh, to the rib cage. Again, you saw the 12 week picture before, the 20 week, 24 week picture is even more significant. This drug was robust. So all the patients had severe hypophosphatasia associated skeletal disease, basically very severe rickets and fractures. The, the healing was striking and, and the, all in, in, so one dropped out, so it's 10. So nine out of the 10 patients had remarkable, just like I showed you, healing of the skeleton. One did not. That one had 
no skeleton, none on initial x-ray. He was a boy who was maintained on a mechanical ventilator. He was three. He did nothing. <coughs> he laid there. So remember, the drug had an affinity for hydroxyapatite. So we kind of think the drug had nowhere to go because there was no mineralized bone. And over time, continually, as he got this longer than 24 weeks, he did mineralize and he did start to look like the rest of them. It just took him longer. Um, interestingly, and I really wanted to talk about this, but the time is not going to allow it, there was a respiratory decline initially that preceded getting better. And we actually studied this with pul serial pulmonary function tests and have a pretty good idea about that. Um, we published that in another paper. You guys could look that up. Um, but I think the mechanism that happened here is very applicable to other dysplasias where there may be some undermineralization, including the collagen 2 apathies, things like campomelic. Uh, if you understand the process, they may not be as lethal as previously described because the management of ventilators and things like that is really different or should be different than the standard management that sort of every baby gets. <coughs> So improvement respiratorily in, it coincided with the mineralization of the rib cage, which was typically seen at about 12 weeks. And by week 48, six out of these nine patients were on room air without any kind of support compared to one out of 11 at baseline. One was just receiving supplemental oxygen through a nasal cannula. Um, one was receiving CPAP at night while asleep, and one, this one that had no skeleton, remained on the full mechanical ventilation. All of the patients had severe motor delays. Nobody, oh, left off weight. Nobody could bear weight. And at 48 weeks, seven out of nine were bearing weight, including four that were walking, one that was standing, and uh, two that were crawling. So six out of, uh, well, 10 patients completed the six months of treatment and entered into the extension. Uh, the reason that it's 10 is that the initial IV infusion, uh, one kid had an infusion reaction and the parents withdrew the child from the study at that point in time. Unfortunately, my patient was the one that died. Um, he, you saw the images, he did fantastically. We got him to a home vent and he actually went home. And, and he did really well at home for about three weeks. And you might remember back then there was that, it was the swine flu epidemic. And um, that's what happened to him. He, he had an acute infection, uh, influenza, and um, he lived kind of rural. And it was about a two hour journey to the local hospital. And by the time he got there, it wasn't even our center, it was just the closest pediatric center. Uh, and it was sort of over for him, unfortunately. But at least I think it's fair to say his skeleton was, was healed. Um, so at the time that this paper was written, um, the nine, these nine patients were continuing to participate in the extension study. Uh, on average, they had received about 18 months of the drug. Um, they had, you know, basically established some parameters. The half-life was about five days, uh, and the bioavailability was about 72 percent. So this was a, a fairly dramatic thing. Safety-wise, um, you know, it was tough in this study because these kids were trying to die, um, but the drug, there were no dr uh, serious adverse events that were felt to be caused by the drug. So again, th this deca aspartate motif is very interesting, and um, I think there's there could be a whole host of different skeletal dysplasias. Think about the osteopetroses, um, in particular, um, some of the Erlenmeyer flask. There's a group in there called the Erlenmeyer flask group. A lot of these are potentially amenable to bone targeting. A lot of the disorders, like Morchio, for example, the disorders in the growth plate, it's not in the bone, and this bone targeting isn't going to help. Um, but this kind of 
motif may sort of open up a, a whole new avenue of treatment possibilities for some of these dysplasias. So the summary from the New England paper was that this appears to be a potential enzyme replacement therapy in patients with life-threatening hypophosphatasia. Now, I've not been involved with any of these things. Uh, Michael White in St. Louis has been the primary driver, but there have been now studies in juvenile forms and in adult forms uh, with similarly dramatic effects. I, they haven't been published. Michael's given multiple talks. He has this wonderful video of a boy who has an abnormal gait. They have a waddling, shuffling gait. And uh, he has this baseline image of him walking up the hall. He's barely making it 10 yards. And after 24 weeks, you see him. And it's this big, big evergreen pine tree. And the kid's sitting on a branch at the top of this tree that he had just climbed up the tree. So it's pretty dramatic results. So the FDA gave this drug a breakthrough therapy designation, and uh, I don't really have a precise time point, but I think um, 14 is probably a reasonable expectation that this drug might be available. There are probably a lot of people walking around with osteoporosis and bad teeth that are sort of subclinical uh, that very well may have this condition at the mild end of the spectrum. And a little bit of drug, sort of premenopausal, uh, may do significant good for that population. So if you're seeing people, CM, uh, alkaline phosphatase levels are part of everybody's CMP pretty much. So just eyeball it. And if it's low, just think about going back the next time you see that patient and, and ask some of these skeletal questions. Okay. So, next. Hi, the hypophosphatases? No. Okay, so moving on. Uh, these two, achondroplasia and the FGFR3 apathies. So fibroblast growth factor receptor 3 is a transmembrane receptor in the FGF signaling pathway. It primarily plays a role in chondrocyte proliferation and differentiation uh, inside the growth plate. Mutations in this gene are responsible for uh, one of the entire groups in that 40 uh, group with achondroplasia being the most common disorder, but there are the two types of thanatophoric dysplasia. There's an intermediate dysplasia termed sedan, severe achondroplasia, developmental delay, and acanthosis nigricans. There's hypochondroplasia, and then there's compound heterozygotes. So there are two achons that um, marry. They might have a child with double dominant achondroplasia. There's case reports of double dominance between um, achondroplasia, hypochondroplasia, et cetera. So, like I just said, dominant, 100% penetrant, about 1 in 26,000 live births. Uh, at least in achondroplasia, these individuals have the identical mutations. It's a G380R mutation uh, caused by two different nucleotide substitutions. Here you see a cartoon of the gene. This is the transmembrane domain, the thymidine kinase domain, intracellularly. These immunoglobulin-like domains, extracellularly. And here you see the spectrum of where the mutations fall. Here's the G380R in the transmembrane. There are, this is the thanatophoric type 1. Uh, outside hypophosphatasia, uh, sorry, hypochondroplasia here. In here, in the different thymidine kinase, TD2, and the sedans. What all of these mutations have in common is they lead to act ligand independent activation of this. So, cell biology has showed us that at baseline, if you have this G380R mutation, you have 82% of maximal activation. I always describe this to families as 
like trying to drive with the parking brake on. The growth plate's there. The growth plate is going to grow. It's going to do its business. The job of the FGFR3 system is to break that growth, is to slow that growth down. And what, what happens in these disorders is these, this constitutive continuous activation is sort of like a parking brake. So the growth plate works and it continues to grow, but the growth rates are not normal. So I just want to briefly touch on uh, thanatophoric. This is all, so between thanatophoric and acon, these are two, two of the most common dysplasias, whether they be seen prenatally or postnatally. Uh, in addition to some of the same features of achondroplasia, there's typically abnormalities in the brain structure itself, most commonly in the temporal lobe. Um, you can see the shortening in this guy's arms is micromelic, and it's far shorter than the arms in achondroplasia. There's a narrow thorax. I won't go through all this. There are two basic types. Uh, type 1 has uh, curved femurs and no craniosynostosis, while type 2 has straight femurs but has a, a cloverleaf skull or craniosynostosis. And this is hypochondroplasia. We have no idea actually what the incidence of hypochondroplasia is because it, people with hypochondroplasia, molecularly confirmed, can have average stature and very subtle disproportion. Uh, so Having said that, people that we think have hypochondroplasia radiographically, only 60% of the time we can find the mutation in the FGFR3 gene. So maybe there's another cause, maybe there's a different molecular mechanism, uh, maybe there's a common phenotype, I'm not sure. But um, usually these are kids that fall off the growth chart between three and five years of age. You can see that there's some rhizomelia here, although this child comfortably uh, gets hands in pockets. Now this is a panel. You can see this is our, the TD uh, with the cloverleaf skull. This is thanatophoric dysplasia. This is a double dominant econ child. And this is an achondroplastic infant. And I hope you can appreciate the lengths of the limbs. They are progressively longer as you go from most severe to most mild. And again, use the parking brake analogy and the constitutive activation analogy. This parking brake is on the most severe. Uh, this is on the least. Hypochondroplasia is really hard to diagnose in infancy, <laughs> which is why I don't have the next picture. So uh, again, this is sort of ligand dependent, I'm sorry, ligand independent activation of this channel. So typically, the FGF comes in, two distinct um, FGFR3s, sometimes it's others, there's FGFR1 and 2, et cetera. Uh, they dimerize, they send off their second messenger signals through that thymidine kinase. In achondroplasia, there's no ligand. FGFR3 just binds to itself and uh, sends out the secondary signals. In TD2, you don't even need it to get to bind to itself to have the second messenger signal go down. Uh, TD1, you do. So there's a similar mechanism, but the degree of signaling is different. So how can you come at this problem? So what you see here is this, here's the braking system, second messengers getting into the nucleus. So there's been, uh, you know, people have been thinking about this for a long time. So maybe you can do something to sort of block the FGFs or the FGFR3 outside the cell at the membrane level from doing its business. Well, there was a company that tried this. They, they developed an antibody that uh, was a fragment, had a very short half-life, didn't do too much. Worked very well, actually, in a dish, but didn't do anything in, a, in an animal model. People have talked about kinase inhi inhibition and, and shut, trying to shut down the second messengers. You know, those are nonspecific molecules. You're going to be shutting down kinases everywhere. And then you have the additional problem of how you're going to get this specifically targeted to the growth plate. 
The other thing that comes in is the CNP pathway. So CNP or C natriuretic peptide, if this is the parking brake system, this is the accelerator system. So we know from typically growing people that CNP levels circulating are directly proportionate to growth velocities and growth. So C CNP acts through this NPRB, its receptor, and it, and it interacts with the second messengers that are triggered through the FGF system. Now when this pathway, I'll just say that on the next slide. So looking, focusing a little bit more on the CNP. So there's a transcript that comes down and there's a, an n peptide that gets cleaved off. This n peptide has a long half-life and can be used as a marker to measure. CNP itself has an incredibly short half-life, so measuring it can be uh, useful, but it doesn't give you enormous information. The CNP can act through its receptor. There's a dummy receptor, but what happens is there's a feedback loop, and when this receptor sees CNP, it goes back into the nucleus and shuts off production. Okay, now back to Biomarin, BMN111. This is a 39 amino acid CNP pharmacologic analog. Uh, it mimics the activity of CNP. It has an extended half-life because it, it has this endopeptidase resistance. This is a picture of it, uh, and it appears to behave fairly similarly. They gave this drug to a knock-in achondroplasia mouse. This was published in December. Here is the dwarf mouse. Here is the typical mouse. And I'm not sure how well this is showing up, but here are some photographs of, uh, on this, this top panel, animals that got 800 micrograms per kilo of this drug. The limbs are longer, but they're not sort of back to normal. So they are in the process of starting a phase two trial multi-center, multinational clinical assessment study for pediatric patients. Uh, my understanding is this is about 40 to 50 kids spread out at the, these different centers. Right now, what they're going to do is basically measure kids every three months between the ages of four and a half and nine. And at some point in time, now they're saying 14, um, they're going to take this. This is sort of growth uh, data as a baseline. They're going to take this data give these kids, or a fraction of these kids, this drug and see if they grow any better. We wanted to ask the question, and I should say we're not involved with that study, but I wanted to ask the question, well, what are CMP levels in achondroplasia? Is there a way that we can answer that question? Are they low? Are they high? Are they the same as everybody else? And moving on for time's sake is basically we initiated a study. We're trying to study 100 acons, hypos, or uh, thanatophorics uh, to see what their CMP levels are. Wait, are you healthy? Can we get a blood draw? So we've been trying to get to 100. Um, we are at like 93, we're so close. Um, but we analyzed the first 58 samples. And um, I don't have the time to get into this, but the CMP levels in this population are high. They're about a standard deviation above the mean, which suggests that there is CNP resistance in this population, um, which may have some implications about this drug trial. I mean, if you think about type 2 diabetes as being insulin resistant, this receptor itself gets downregulated. Uh, you don't, you can't treat it with more insulin. You need to use other kinds of strategies. So. We'll see if this, this drug has an effect, but this pathway is already being altered by whatever the achondroplasia phenotype is. So I, that, that's it. Just uh, acknowledge you've got a pretty big group at, at DuPont. This is uh, our smiling pictures. Um, Mike White for his help with hypophosphatasia. Rob Olney, who's with Pam in Jacksonville, um, is a CNP expert who helped with this. These are our folks in New Zealand who are actually measuring the CNP and my brood for allowing me to be here. <laughs> Thanks.
Thanks, Mike. That was really, really interesting. Um, I, I wonder if you could speculate about this uh, DECA aspartic signal in other lysosomal enzyme disorders where we are not very successful with bone. Gaucher is a perfectly good example of that. Yeah, I mean, so Gaucher, I, I guess it would depend on it. You, you can certainly put that enzyme next to hydroxyapatite. Would it help your macrophages metabolize the, the bone? I don't know. Um, I mean, to me, this is all ripe for mouse modeling. Is this, you, know, you, have the, you have the enzyme, it's very easy to hook it onto this, you know, from a pharmaceutical perspective. And we have the animals. I mean, we should go at these things. I, I really think it opens a whole new door. Any other questions? All right, thanks.